Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Will you settle down? Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we appreciate you being here, whether you are present or whether you are on uh, live stream today. We welcome you and thank you for joining us. Um, before we get started with our worship service, as usual, just a few different announcements. Uh, first thing I wanted to mention is in regards to Christmas Eve service. Um, 6 p.m., and uh, we'll do a traditional candlelight service that evening, and so we invite you to come out for that, invite family and friends to that as well. And then the big thing that we have happening on site over the next, uh, starting the, f the Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 18th, is Festival of Trains. And um, so the, that's an organization in the area that's a train aficionados, and they have traditionally done their festival of trains downtown, and they are going to be this year on site with us. And so if you wander over towards the gym, you will see already they have started to set up over there. Looks wonderful. It's going to look even better once they get fully set up. And the incredible opportunity that we have to host them is a real benefit. And so I want to just um, invite you for, uh, just to help out with a few different things. The first of which is one of the commitments that we've made is to provide a place for them, for those who are uh, working in charge, running the trains, all, in charge of all of that, um, giving them an area over here in the foyer just as kind of a rest area to get away from the crowds, maybe to eat lunch or just to get a, a chance to have a quiet place. So the foyer will be set up each day with coffee, with some snacks, and we're looking for a few different things. The first thing we're do looking for is those who might come in and say, hey, I'll spend some time, I'll get the coffee set up, I'll provide some hospitality for people if there's any need, if they need to get, you know, know their way around, we can answer questions. In some cases, it might just be bringing a book over and sitting in the foyer and just reading or doing some of your own work and just being available in case they come over to greet them and provide hospitality. You may want to start a fire in there. If you start a fire out there in the foyer, uh, Pastor Matt is much more likely to come and join you uh, and we'll enjoy some time together out there. The other thing we need is those to make cookies and snacks to provide for them over the course of uh, that time. And so we have a sign-up sheet out in the foyer for that as well. So we are um, uh, really looking forward to hosting them and as well as hosting the folks who are actually putting on the Festival of Trains, also the thousands of people that come through for that. So we want to be able to be um, hospitable and be able to host them well. I uh, also want to remind you when the holiday is over, um, my wife Debbie is going to be starting a new woman's Bible study, and you can see her. She can wave in the back. Um, if you want some answers, uh, she's usually up front, but the wheelchair is just, you know, she's, it's, she's scared she's going to run right into somebody rolling down the floor here. Um, but if you're interested, ladies, if you're interested in that Bible study and learning more about it, please see her. Let's stand at this time, find someone you haven't greeted yet, and say hello to them.
Good morning. What a beautiful day to be gathered here together. I tell you guys what, my usual goal for the morning is that I wait until Pastor Matt is the farthest possible distance from his seat before I start saying good morning, just to make it the most awkward for him to walk back. <laughs> Let's come together and worship together this morning.
Thank you for your worship. We invite you to be seated. We've been kind of walking through some of the different challenges that we face at the holidays uh, throughout this um, time of Advent. And um, one of them that we're going to talk about today is, is somewhat represented in a portion of Scripture that, quite honestly, is one of my favorite portions of Scripture. And um, it confounds me in some ways because I don't know how God ever accomplished this, but it also challenges us in a lot of ways. And so as we light our third candle of the Advent season, I read Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5, where it says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. As we light the third candle of Advent today, we are mindful that Christ humbled himself, um, that he was willing to come down, that his love for us is so deep, um, so wide, so vast, so eternal, that God would humble himself to come to earth as a baby, and to come to earth ultimately to be our savior. The other thing that's very interesting about that whole portion of scripture is remember how it begins. Your attitude should be the same. And that's a challenge for us, and I think at Christmas time and throughout the Advent season, one of the real challenges is as we go through this period of time, as we are mindful of who Christ is, one of the things we have to deal with is our own humility. Is is are we allowing the Holy Spirit to cause our hearts, our minds, all of our being to stand before God in humility and to stand before others in humility? Let's pray together. Lord, we welcome you. 2,000 years ago, there weren't any there much to welcome you. And yet, in humility, you came. And you came as a baby. You came as um, in humility. You humbled yourself to come down and to take that place. And then um, you humbled yourself and became obedient even to death on a cross. Lord, we are here today only because of you. Help us to be mindful of that. And help us to know what you want to do in us and through us as we live like you in humility. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Before we get started today, I would just like to remind everyone that our table is open to those who believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. And in the event that you did not get the elements this morning, <laughs> we 
do have some extras here, so everybody has what is needed. Okay. So, before we begin our devotional this morning, I would like to start with Scripture. And it comes to us from John 14, 12, and it states, I'm telling you the truth. Those who believe in me will do what I do. Yes, they will do even greater things because I'm going to the Father. What if I told you all you have a great purpose and you have the power for that great purpose? Would you believe me? Well, it's true. You are. You have that power. You have that purpose. By Jesus' own admission, we can go and do greater things than he did. Whereas Jesus could only be in one place at a time, teaching about God's kingdom to one group at a time, God's people now spans to the entire globe. By the power of the Holy Spirit and the resources available to us, we too can have a greater impact when we all play our part. The Spirit guides us. It provides wisdom. It supplies our needs when we need them and are called upon to do God's work. So what is God calling you to do? Regardless of God's calling on your life, accomplishing what God commissions you to do should be your priority no matter what. When you do this, you will be honoring God. According to Scripture, there are many ways to follow Jesus' footsteps or to achieve the, the greater things, as stated earlier. One way, in which we, I, one way which I find to be very significant, and all can do it, is to be people in prayer. Through prayer, through prayer, we can discern whom we must help and receive guidance on how we can care for their needs. God wants us to care for their needs of people, regardless of the risk, the objection from others, the condemnation from the world. Doing what is right is what God requires. Keep in mind, I'm sorry, people who benefit from this good, our good works might ask, why did you help me? This presents an opportunity to tell them how you've been empowered by God to help and how, that great, how great that is to share with people that you have hope as well. Keep in mind that it is very important to be connected to the power source, and that is the Holy Spirit, as it will help guide you, it will effectively serve you, and love, help you love your neighbors. Otherwise, it's easy to fall prey to sins that weaken us, leaving us unable to continue to do greater things. The psalmist remind us to live in the presence of God continually, and we will be protected, cared for, and provided throughout our lives. This stands true in Psalms 91, as it is filled with the goodness and the power of God, and reminds us that he faithfully works on behalf of those who love him. His promise because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him, I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will, he will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him from honor, and I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalms 91, 14 through 16. I ask, what more could we possibly need in order to do his work than what was just read? As we come to the communion table, knowing that we have the purpose to fulfill and the power to do so, we also must remember the cross. That on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He broke it, and with thanks, he said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Will you please join me in the partaking of the bread? Likewise, he took the cup, and with thanks, he said, 
take, drink. This is the blood of my body, and this is the new and everlasting covenant for the forgiveness of sins. We will close in prayer, and afterwards we will partake of the element together. Will you please pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that enables us to do great things for you. Help us to boldly share and hope, share our hope in you so that these that those who hear will start their journey with you. Amen. Would you please stand with us? Treasure of heaven, brilliant like the stars in the wintry sky. Joy of the Father, reach through the darkness, shine across the earth, send the shadows to fly. Light of the
Amen. Thank you for your worship. <clears throat> uh, before I get into my sermon, I just want to remind you of a couple things um, that I think are um, encouraging and um, that we should keep uh, mindful of. Um, as I have shared before, and some of you got a chance to meet some of these folks, there are, um, we, are, we have hired a second pastor, and um, Pastor James Palmer will join us. He is actually headed on vacation for a couple weeks, finishing up his ministry uh, at Bayview across town, and then coming over and joining us at the beginning of January. So you will see him uh, quite a bit starting at the beginning of January. And as a result of his opportunity to speak with um, Bayview Wesleyan about where we're going as far as um, our transition and moving forward as a local church, there are some folks that are coming over. Um, they're praying right now. There's about 15 to 20 of them who are praying about coming over and joining with us. And um, some of them, in fact, probably about a third of those 50 to 15 to 20 represent um, uh, 10 years of age or under. And we have been praying uh, for the ability to be able to get over uh, one hump as far as moving forward to church, and that is reestablishing our nursery, reestablishing children's ministry. And um, if those families decide to join us, Come January, we will reestablish um, that children's ministry and also move forward with those families and those individuals joining us from Bayview uh, along with Pastor James. So just want to uh, encourage you in regards to a couple things, one of which is um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's always a little bit of a change when you have youngins around, uh, and so you have to be uh, ready and willing to take on that energy and, um, and so we need to kind of prepare ourselves um, spiritually and emotionally to having those kids around and being a tremendous encouragement to them and to their families. And so that's a real attractive thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, we have, within First Christian Church, one of our greatest strengths is our hospitality. And so I want to just encourage you as they come in, as we welcome newcomers, whether it's them or others who are coming in, uh, I want to just encourage us to continue to offer that hospitality to people and um, perform that ministry and um, just see what God is doing. Um, we've been through two years of a transition, and I believe we are about to really take off. And that is very encouraging when we see the direction that we're going and the enthusiasm that we have. And so let's keep that going and see what God does over the next several months in the life of First Christian Church. Um, we have been in the middle of this series that I entitled Worst Case Scenario Survival Guide to Christmas. I know that when people hear that, they think to themselves, where is this guy going with this stuff? I mean, isn't, isn't Christmas supposed to be an encouraging time? And now here is this guy talking about worst case scenario. And it comes out of this book, the Worst Case Scenario Survival Handbook. Um, and not that this is what I'm preaching from. I'm preaching from God's Word. But um, this kind of propelled me into this idea that although the holidays can be such encouraging times, there's also challenge associated with holidays and uh, all that surrounds it and how our culture looks at it. And the last couple of weeks, we took a look at how this is the time of year where more people um, struggle with issues of depression. And so two weeks ago, we talked about that, about how do we find joy in um, a world that it sometimes can really beat us down. And for many of us, we may be having a very exciting holiday this year and things are really looking good, but we have to recognize something is that many of us have been through periods in our lives where the holidays were not attractive time periods. They were a time of being alone. They were a time of after broken relationships, trying to pick up pieces. And so they were difficult times. And we recognize that we may come into contact with people who are dealing with that. And we need to be ready to be able to be a ministry to those who we say, Merry Christmas to, and they say, Bah humbug. <laughs> you know, or, you know, that's just where they're at. And yet, God can do a work. We know God can do a work to restore joy in our lives. Many of us have seen that. Um, and so we look forward to how we can be a ministry to people that may be in that scenario in their lives. Um, last week, 
uh, we talked about this idea of the struggle that our culture goes through with consumerism. And so we can be wonderfully joyful in what God has given to us and know that he takes care of our daily needs. At the same time, we can fall into this pattern of the world that just needs more and more and more and more to be happy. And so we've talked about those two. And um, I want to talk about this. The one today is some, one of the highest of joys, but also one of the biggest challenges we face in our lives. And um, that is family during the holidays. Now, I know that there are those of you who are going to get together with family and you're going to open your door and there's going to be your grandkids there, which kids are more excited about Christmas time, you know, pretty much than any other time of the year. And so their eyes are going to be, you know, lit up. They're going to love to see grandma and grandpa because it means that they get extra treats and they get Christmas gifts and all the stuff that comes with family getting together. Um, but we also recognize that there's challenges at times. And I want to talk a little bit about the survival guide of a family led by the incarnation. So um, this morning, I, I turned to Debbie and I said, you know, I have had five or six different illustrations to start this sermon out, and I have pitched every single one of them. And I had a sermon, but I had no opening illustration. And so I thought, well, I could just not do an opening illustration and the sermon would be a lot shorter, but that's not what you guys want at all. <laughs> I, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Pastor Matt, we want this to be as long as possible, so make sure you have a good long opening illustration, 85 points, a few sub points to go with them. But as soon as I said that to her, it popped into my mind what my illustration should be. However, I didn't tell her because I wanted to surprise her. Just so you know, that might be a good thing. That might be not such a good thing. Let's see where this goes. Um, of course, many of you, um, just because of the events surrounding Debbie and I get together, getting together, you, you know, you knew either, you know, some of you knew Debbie before you knew me, you got to know me, then you heard about during the midst of, um, I, I said, I, uh, there's, a, there's a book that was written, Love in a Time of Cholera, that was put, made into a movie, and I always said I, we should write a book called Love in a Time of Coronavirus. Because uh, Debbie and I fell for each other uh, when everything was pretty much locked down. And um, God drew us together in a real supernatural way. And we continue to rejoice in what he's done in our relationship. And Joan's already crying. She's going to make me cry here too, you know. But it, it really has been an incredible blessing. But one of the things that um, we did is obviously we talked on the phone a lot because we were separated by distance. We did the FaceTime thing and were able to talk. And, and so we got far enough and along in our relationship, we were sharing different things about ourselves and about who we were. And finally, during a time when, you know, I just felt like it was time for me to share this, I said, you know, I just want you to, to let you know <clears throat> that I'm a bit of a barbarian. And there was silence for a few seconds at the other end of the line. And, and Debbie finally said, well, what do you mean by that? And um, I, I won't go into de deep detail about why I refer to myself sometimes as a barbarian, um, but uh, what I have seen is... Um, the tendencies that I have that lead me to say that about myself um, have been met with a, a beautiful, godly response of, of patience and restraint and self-control. And at times when I come into the setting strongly, um, some of you who have worked closely with me know that at times I have strong opinions, passionate opinions about certain things. And of course, when you have a spouse that you love and you appreciate and you can share openly with, you tend to really just lay it all out there about how you feel and what you think and what you're going through at the time. And so I thought to myself, this is my opening illustration of being able to point to a, a, a person in my life who I, I love very deeply, and who accepts that side of me. 
And that's a lot of marriage and family, and all of us know who have been uh, in relationship with each other within marriage or family or close friendships or whatever it is, there are times when as we get to know someone, we find ourselves saying, um, how am I going to handle this? How am I going to bear with this? And that can be in very little ways, from failing to put the toilet seat down, to big things that require us to be able to have, and, and the word I'm going to use today is um, the word forbearance. And I want to talk a little bit about this idea of a family and relationships that are led by Christ and empowered and directed by the Holy Spirit. There is going to be a strong level of forbearance because we have to figure out how to get along. And sometimes we're just not get going to get along. And so what does that look like within a relationship? Um, Jesus is the model of this, of, of one who, is, um, who lives a life of forbearance. And let me um, share with you, just if you look up the, the definition of forbearance, it just very simply, it says to have patient self-control and restraint. We live in a culture that oftentimes doesn't have a sense of self-control and restraint. That um, uh, I think for years, the, the Victorian era of our culture was one of heavy restraint. You, you always really thought before you reacted, and, and you still see people who are, you know, very, um, a sense of, you know, you, you be very, you're very careful the front that you put on publicly. Now, the unfortunate thing is just because that's the front publicly doesn't mean that that's the way they were acting behind the scenes. But the truth of the matter is, is now we live in a culture that really kind of just says, just let it all hang out there. Say anything, be anything, do anything. You don't have to worry about any restraint or self-control. Just act however you want, say whatever you want, write on the computer whatever you want for the world to see. And so the issue is, how do we come to a point where we have a godly forbearance, a godly patient self-control and restraint? The scripture I read earlier, Philippians chapter 2, that talks about this is um, the fact that Jesus Christ was willing to make himself nothing, to take on this essence of humility. Christ is our example of forbearance, this um, restraint and self-control. And I want to share a couple of ways about that. Is If you can think about it, is um, Jesus gave himself in the incarnation and it required him to give up quite a bit. I mean, if you think about it, it is the most powerful being in all the universe had to somehow spin himself into the form of a baby. That's tremendous emptying, as the scripture says, emptying himself and being willing to not be God for a while. I don't even know how it occurs. That's why that... Philippians chapter 2, go back and read it again later and just ask yourself, how does God even do that? How does God even just decide that I have all this power, I have all this glory, and I'm going to give it all up, and I'm going to come down and I'm going to become a baby? I'm going to place myself under the authority of my parents, under the authority of the world, and there's a tremendous amount of restraint and forbearance and self-control that takes place in him emptying himself of all that power and all that glory for him to come down. So he is the one who is our example in that. The other side of this that I think is important is to think about the amount of forbearance and restraint that Jesus had to have while he was on earth. Now, you and I both know there are people that just tick us off. I mean, it's just, there's, there's and, and you can make the list. In fact, some of my opening illustrations had to do with things like uh, in the workplace. You know, I told Debbie, I said, one of the ones I thought about was the poster that you probably saw years ago that said, how am I supposed to fly like eagles when I have to work with a bunch of turkeys? You know, and it just, you know, it's just like, you know, and you don't want to hang that up in the office, you know, at your desk, but sometimes you're thinking it. Or, um, 
the idea of the amount of forbearance and restraint sometimes we have to have when we're driving. And that was another one of the, and I've used that open illustration before I told Debbie, I said, I can't use that one again, and here I am using it again. Um, but it's not my opening one, okay? Um, and I, you know, it's just like, we, sometimes we have to have a tremendous amount of restraint when we're driving. Now, just a reminder is sometimes other people have to have a tremendous amount of forbearance and restraint when we're the ones who are making the boo-boos and the mistakes. If we feel that emotionally, imagine what Christ himself felt like on earth with some of the things that the knuckleheads around him said and did. And how much of this sense of forbearance and restraint and self-control he had to have, not just in spinning himself into flesh in the incarnation, but living on earth and watching all of the destruction that was going on around him. And the scripture says he knew the hearts of people. And can you imagine the struggle it must have been for him at times to say, I'm just going to hold my tongue here. Because there were a couple times where he really did let it out. And, and um, the woes to the Pharisees of Matthew 22, where he just really did give them a piece of his mind. And so Jesus is our pattern here of someone who had a tremendous amount of patience and self-control. Um, Jesus had a tremendous amount of forbearance in his death. Because the only one who put Christ on the cross was himself. It, it wasn't the Roman soldiers. It wasn't the Jewish authorities of the Sanhedrin. Christ put himself on the cross. That was planned from the very beginning. And we see that testimony of all through the Old Testament that there was going to be a Messiah and that Messiah would sacrifice himself. And so here Christ is, who literally said, right at the time of his arrest, he turned to Philip and he said, don't you know that I could call down legions of angels at this moment? And I won't. And the reason he didn't is because, and, and this is where forbearance finds its home, Forbearance finds its home, self-control and restraint finds its home in great love. That's, that's why we have self-control. Um, all of us have been around family members, and especially if we've raised kids and have grandkids around, where sometimes they just, as kids, they open their mouth and they say something, and you just, yeah, you just want to react. And sometimes you just have to be able to say, my love for this person causes me to refrain. And that's exactly what the testimony of Christ was. Why did he refrain? Why did he have that self-control, that restraint, that forbearance? It was because of his great love for us. He came down in the incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas time because of his great love. The scripture is clear on that testimony. He healed, he delivered, he ministered, he taught. All the things he did while he was on earth, he did out of his great love. He could have called 10,000 angels down, and what would have happened? The cross never would have happened, and we would not find our salvation in the cross. And it was his great love that restrained him and that ultimately caused him the self-control to be able to go to the cross. So when we have Christ as our example, how do we or how does the Holy Spirit grow us in forbearance? So here's the interesting thing is I shared with you what the general definition of forbearance is. So if you just typed in definition forbearance and you popped up, I shared with you that general definition of forbearance and listen to it again. Patient, self-control, and restraint. If you look up the fruits of the Spirit, there are nine that are listed. And the simple definition for forbearance lists two of those fruits of the Spirit. So the interesting thing is, in the English language, we've chosen a word 
that means this kind of restraint and having self-control, this forbearance. And when we define it, we use two of the fruits of the Holy Spirit to define it. Patience and self-control. And so it's the Holy Spirit that teaches us forbearance, teaches us self-control, teaches us restraint. And the truth of the matter is, is when life is down and dirty and, and we get together with family for the holidays, there is the fruit of the spirit of joy and the fruit of the spirit of love. And it is, family life is at its best when we just have that love and that appreciation and that joy and we're around the table or we're enjoying a game, football game on TV together or we're playing some games or we're just having conversation over coffee. The fruits of the spirit of love and joy are what we all want when it comes to holidays and people getting together. But we also realize that there's a reason why the Holy Spirit gives us the fruits of the spirit of self-control and patience. And the truth of the matter is, is sometimes we just annoy each other. Um, that's a little part of the idea of when I tell people that sometimes I can be a little bit of a barbarian. Sometimes I'm just going to annoy you a little bit. I'm sure I've done it to one or two of you already. By the time I, you know, leave here as your pastor, I will have done it to three or four of you, I'm sure. <laughs> All of us have that ability to um, have a relationship that at times just feels like soft cotton against our skin. And just that, that love and that joy and that warm appreciation of um, I have um, in my home, on my half of the bed at night, what I refer to as my blankie. Um, my blankie is a um, Hudson Bay 100% wool blanket. Back in the day when they really made wool blankets good. And um, what do you refer to it as? Me cocooning. I, I cocoon when I sleep. And the reason is, is because I just want something wrapped around me tight and that love and that joy at Christmas time is like cocooning in and just having family around and how appreciative of it. And, but every once in a while, um, we feel like our relationships are like sandpaper. And that doesn't feel all that great. And sandpaper is needed for certain jobs, but we certainly aren't going to use it to cover ourselves, snuggle up with. And the worst thing in the world is to be using sandpaper and to slip and then to rip your knuckles right over that sandpaper. And so from an emotional standpoint, sometimes our relationships are like ripping your knuckles over the sandpaper. What do you do with that? How do we survive that sort of thing? So what I want to tell you is family is the consistent crucible where forbearance is forged. And this is the one thing, if you're going to take away just one thing, it's this. It's family is the consistent crucible where forbearance is forged. Um, the crucible is where the blacksmith or the people that are, you know, melting down metals, working with something that requires a tremendous amount of heat to be able to melt, is that crucible is heated to an incredible temperature. Scripture often uses that metaphor, crucible, for where sometimes our faith has to go, into the crucible, into the heat, into the fire. And um, the idea of God developing us in self-control, in patience, in restraint, and in forbearance, that is more of a sandpaper and crucible kind of experience. It's hard. It's difficult. And yet, God sometimes will place us in those kind of environments. I have four siblings. I love them, appreciate each one, but all of us are very different personalities. And you have siblings, parents, children, grandchildren, cousins, Uncle Festers, Aunt Bees, whoever they may be. 
that are very special to you because they're family, but we also realize that sometimes it's very challenging. Um, sometimes it's challenging during different seasons because of where you're at in age or where you're at in experience or different things like that. Sometimes it's just challenging the whole way, the whole time. And so what is God trying to do in this idea of the Holy Spirit growing us up in self-control and in patience? So one of the things I think we have to do is we have to ask the Holy Spirit for help. Because if you're going to be placed in that crucible and in that forge, um, Christ was there as well. He had to exercise tremendous restraint, as we already talked about. And that the Holy Spirit sometimes is going to place us in situations where we are going to grow. You can't grow in patience and you can't grow in self-control unless we are placed in circumstances and situations that require that patience and that self-control. So the first thing is we need to ask the Holy Spirit for help because we are going to be in those circumstances. Maybe you're not today, but you probably could point back to a time when you were in some family relationship and in the crucible of trying to figure out how do I exercise self-control and restraint. We need to ask the Holy Spirit for help and say, Lord, I'm not very good at this. The loving, the squeezing, the peace, the times together that feel like that soft cotton, bring it on. The sandpaper, God, can't you do something? Can't, and sometimes what we often say is, God, can't you change them? Ouch. Because usually it's the Holy Spirit that speaks back into our lives saying, maybe I want to change you. Because if you're going to be patient and you're going to be a person of self-control, if you're not in the furnace, if you're not in the fire, how will you ever find that patience and that self-control. The, 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 the spiritual blacksmithing process of forbearance in family is a challenging one. Um, I, I do not see any examples in Scripture of... So there's, there's different events and different activities you can be a part of. And so think about the blacksmithing process and think about the fact that many times Scripture uses that idea of being in the fire, being forged. So I, have, I can't find any place in Scripture where there's a metaphor for arranging flowers. You know, because, I mean, think about it is arranging flowers is like that cottony kind of feel. That's nice. That's fun. God d doesn't tend to use those kind of illustrations. And the reason is, is because we live in a broken world. And because we live in a broken world, patience and self-control is required. If all it was was arranging flowers, we wouldn't need the forge. We wouldn't need the fire. And so God places us in those situations, and, and um, because we're not arranging flowers, and, and by the way, this is not best-case scenario survival guide to Christmas. This is worst-case scenario. Because the truth of the matter is, the, when the best happen, when we're arranging flowers, when the love and the peace is happening, that flows so naturally, and it's very welcome. When God decides to place us in the forge and in the fire, he's doing something in our lives. He's doing something in our hearts. He's doing something in our minds. He is working out our salvation and allowing us to become more Christ-like. The Holy Spirit wants us to be people of forbearance, people of self-control, people of patience. If we decide we're just going to do it on our own, then what I would say is um, go out and drive around town, and when somebody cuts you off, uh, 
when somebody cuts you off, you go ahead and lose control. If you don't want the Holy Spirit working in you, then go ahead and lose control. Um, there is nothing that God is going to train you up in when you just decide to lose control. When you come upon family situations and family struggles, if you decide, I'm just going to lose control, then there is nothing that the Holy Spirit can train you up in. There is, there is no righteousness that's going to come out of that. And I'm not saying it's easy because, like I said, this, this one isn't best case scenario. This one isn't about arranging flowers. This is hard stuff sometimes. And the idea of, of saying, I really want to speak right now, and I'm going to refrain. I really want to act right now out of my sinful nature, and I'm going to exercise self-control. Um, is one that will be rewarded in the long run. It, it may not be rewarded right away, but there's two things that occur. The one is for yourself, the other is for the other person. And so it's very easy in this kind of a cir circumstance and situation. In fact, I have one family member that I can, in my mind, that's probably my biggest struggle sometimes with this idea of, of refraining self-control, forbearance, is two things occur when we practice forbearance. The first of which is Christ dwells in us in a very rich manner. And that's a spiritual richness. When we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives in such a way that we exercise self-control and patience, the Holy Spirit dwells in us richly. Because the worst thing in the world is to lose control and find ourselves with regrets, find ourselves broken, find ourselves um, feeling as though we have failed. We, when we practice that forbearance, Christ dwells in us richly, and we sense that. The second one is when we practice forbearance, the person that we practice it with eventually is going to see us differently than they see the world. There will be a line where they'll say, for some reason, this person, this family member, loves me enough that no matter how I act or what I say, they practice self-control and patience. Versus the worst case scenario of letting it go and destroying any opportunity we would have to be able to speak Christ into that person's life. And this is probably the most difficult thing I've experienced in relationships that I've had over the years is, is times when I have lost control or times when I have not listened to the Holy Spirit and I've said things that I wish I could pull back. My greatest regret in that is will that person be able to see Christ in my life after what I've said or what I've done? And that's the most important thing. Not even the most important thing is that the relationship between me and that other person is good, but will that person be able to see Christ? And that's the goal of forbearance. That's the goal of patience and self-control is for us to live a life that is pleasing to God, that is like Christ, that is guided by the Holy Spirit, and as a result, we rejoice at what Christ is doing in us, and they will be drawn to join us in that relationship with Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, all of us know that at times relationships can be extremely difficult, um, like that sandpaper. And Lord, um, there's times when, when relationships are fun and easy. They're just wonderful and they're such a blessing. And you have created us for relationship with you, a love relationship with you. You've created us for a love relationship with the people around us. 
But because we live in a broken world, there are times when it's, it's very challenging. But Lord, at those moments when they're challenging, that is when our faith truly is displayed. Or unfortunately, Lord, sometimes that's when our lack of faith is displayed. So Lord, I pray that you'd grow us up. Every single one of us could point at times and seasons in our life where we have just utterly blown it and not been able to practice self-control, not been able to practice patience, forbearance out the window. And so, Lord, teach us, grow us up in this, and I pray just over the next few weeks that as we are mindful of what you, the Holy Spirit, want to do in our lives, that as we get together for holidays with family, that we would be able to sense and practice that, that beautiful forbearance that self-control, that patience that only you can bring in those situations. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.
God, we have this wonderful, wonderful opportunity. You created family um, for a purpose. You created the very closest of our human relationships to be this incredible blessing to us, and in so many ways they are. Lord, I, I pray that if there are those times when we need to say, Lord, help me in this, help me in this struggle, that as you are faithful, we would be faithful. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope you stick around. Um, as I've already said before, uh, one of First Christian's strengths is our fellowship time after the service. So I hope you stick around and uh, get to know folks and join us for coffee and some cookies. Uh, if you have a need of prayer, uh, we have elders that are available. If you'd like somebody to pray with you today, uh, an elder will be right here by the table.